Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tom Garcia Prats. Thanks for having me here. Anytime I get the chance to speak about um, the farm and what we do, um, I really think that's a valuable opportunity for us. Um, I'm an endangered species here in Houston. I'm a young farmer. Um, and that's something that um, has inspired Dan and I to do the work that we do. We have founded the only privately run farm inside the 610 loop called Finca Tres Robles. We're located in the second ward, um, close to navigation and wayside. You know where Nicholas is? Just keep going down navigation east a couple miles and we're right there. Um, we lease an acre and a quarter of land where we grow organic produce right there. And we do as much as possible to um, be a resource for our media community through a CSA. And I'm not going to get into all that we do, but um, we really work hard to um, provide education opportunities, fresh produce, and be a resource to people to come learn about um, why farming is important and why it's something that needs to be part of the conversation in urban and rural spaces. Carol Perrette with Memorial Herman. I'm the Chief Community Benefits Officer. And uh, one of the things that we've really been involved in for the last two years is how you really integrate the conversation around nutrition into medicine. Um, you know, knowing somebody's food insecure can change the whole clinical conversation. But most of the time, we don't know that, right? And so all those patients that we call non-compliant, maybe if we understood where health sits in their context, we would understand um, why we're getting the results we're getting in medicine. And so it's, it's really about we've got to do something different if we're going to get different outcomes. And this is one area that we really engaged around trying to figure out how we really integrate the knowledge into changing the clinical care that our patients receive. Thank you. Um, so does anyone have any questions for our speakers today? I have a question for Reggie. I wondered if the people who started to come to get the food, the, the fact that you said it sort of fell off after the third or fourth time they came, do you think there was an element of embarrassment or shame about going there to receive the food? So we're not sure. A lot of the responses we didn't get that, we didn't get that sense. Uh, one of the things that we did differently with the pantry was that we basically separated, it's actually a different space than the, the regular pantry that they operate, and they had different hours, and so only, only people that were going to that pantry were, were patients from these different clinics and so forth. So, and it was designed specifically for them, so it was actually set up like a grocery store. So it was one of the things that we really found important was to really replicate the experience that they would have if they had never been to a pantry before. So, uh, so we really try to be really intentional in the design of the pantry to make it something that they would want to come back to on a regular basis. So, so we're not sure, but uh, we're definitely still trying to learn more about it. And, uh, seeing if there, if it is that, what can we do better in order to make sure that they feel more comfortable about coming to this space? I have a follow-up to that. Do you think that their seasonality has anything to do with that? That was my thought was, we see that for children at least, summertime, and times when they're out of school, it's definitely higher food insecurity. So I'm curious if maybe because of the work some of our families do or because the children are or are not in school, if some of that sort of ebbs and flows throughout the year. Well, one of the things that both the clinics as well as the other community partners that we had in North Pasadena did tell us a lot of occasions was that uh, the population was very transient. So people uh, could be there for six months and then their address may change and so forth, and you know, you don't hear about them anymore. So that was one of the things that we considered early on. Uh, but we still, I mean, we still, we still don't know. But, uh, but but that is definitely one of the things that we were trying to keep in the back of our minds: the fact that this population is very transient. It's just something that's going to be there. Uh, this may be for Reginald or Carol. Uh, as far as the workflows in the clinics, 
what have you found was the best process to actually do the screenings? Was it pen and paper, patient self-report, or an interview by the, by the medical assistant, uh, something on an iPad? How did you integrate it within the uh, electronic medical record if you did any of that or saw any of that? Can you so talk I, about I that? I've talked to Carol about this before, so I know she has an answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> so we have integrated it into our medical records. if that's okay. Thank you guys all so much. I'm really um, enjoying this forum a lot, but a, a lot of, uh, I'm a pediatrician as well at, at Texas Children's, and what we're finding is more and more people are screening, and, and I'd love to hear from, from all the panelists if you have ideas on them. What, what is the optimal way of us helping our, our families? What, what is the optimal way that, uh, as a clinic, we can actually you know, do the best job that we can getting our patients access to resources. I mean, a lot of times we give them a handout, we connect them with the food bank, um, but what, what is the optimal process for, for doing that that you found here locally? My question is for, um, I believe it's Ms. Sandra and Mr. Thomas. Um, so I am a social worker at Texas Children's. Um, and so what I'm wondering is, well, the, a large majority of the patients that I see are, are from lower income areas, like um, Sunnyside or like Second World where you're at. Um, and so it's like, with your education that you guys provide, um, it's good, but then how do they now translate it to real life? So if you're renting property and it's not your property or if you're in an apartment, um, how do they take what they're learning about sustainable living um, and, or if they're in food, 
food deserts and they're, say they're limited on transportation because they're on the public transportation. How do you then help them to transition that and to meet where they're at in their life? Well, I think part of the issue is there's so many different facets of individuals' lives that are being to be overcome. Um, part of what our mission is as a farm is to really serve the people closest to us. We push a lot of initiatives so that um, we can be that resource. So we personally subsidize a large portion of our CSA, which CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. So people invest in the farm for the season, they get a share of produce every week for that season. Yeah, we provide a 15 to 25% discount for people who live in the forest and the farm. And we also do um, community CSA where people sponsor a share of produce and that goes to um, the local um, pre-K, which is the Miller uh, Early Childhood Center. So that's young families with young children, literally three blocks away from the farm that will get access to our seasonal fresh produce organically grown every, every week. Um, and part of that is um, making ourselves and um, the food experience more real and more tangible and more accessible. And in my experience, I can't think of a better way to do that in my community than to be in my community. Um, so that's one way that we're like trying to push towards that. Um, but again, there are so many factors that um, our families are trying to overcome and deal with. And this is just like one avenue to try to address that um, the multi-faceted layers that are trying to work And I, I agree. It, it's, there's a lot, there, there are a lot in these families. And to say, well, we're going through this, this is, this is a slow growth. But it is a long-term, um, at least a piece of trying to help. And it is empowering. What we've seen is that the kids are very interested in problems in their wireless schools and that it's skipped a generation. So their grandparents are very interested in probably good food, but then you have the parents who have two jobs, three jobs, and where that's blended. I mean, so our family education is really critical. Just teaching the kids around is, is a very strong piece of it. Um, and then, of course, the, the gardens that are around. But it is the same issue with the child. So I, I think family education, I, I really think nutrition education, to understand, to create the desire to have the, the healthy, fresh food will help a lot. And I'm really excited that the medical community is sort of addressing that. Because it, it's, um, I think it's been missing in the past. So. It's obesity. Say a case of the past. It was actually the first way that we tried to approach it was 
to that our issue was obesity. So we actually changed that to food insecurity because of that exact same reason. So a lot of our conversation, not only between uh, the partners, but also with, uh, with our uh, community trustees, was really around, okay, is this the, the best way of messaging what we're trying to accomplish here? And are we, can we approach this in another way that really uh, people that are obese uh, could benefit from this as well, but they don't feel isolated or targeted by any way by this collective as well. So, so I think it was a With the food prescription program, what is the range of physical distance from the clinics to where the food pantries are, and does that play a role in how much uptake there is of the program? I'm sure it does. Uh, so, are you looking at that? Yeah. So it's pretty central if you take all of the all of the uh, clinics in, in consideration. So it's probably about five to seven miles from most of the clinics. Uh, the one that's the, the furthest away is, of course, the southeast. Very uh, so it's pretty close to most of them, but when we were talking to the patients, five to six miles would be very long ago. And what percent of, of the patients are relying on public transportation? That we don't know. That's something that we're trying to focus on. And one of the things, the wholesome wave is a redemption and target. Yes. So that's something that we're trying to focus on. Um, I kind of want to go back to the um, case that he brought up as far as obesity. Um, with the high obesity rates in Harris County, as um, the information packets here say, I just was kind of curious as far as what kinds of outcome measures your various programs have in place to, to pretty much determine the effectiveness of these programs on um, obesity rates. Are obesity rates decreasing among, pe among people that are coming seeking assistance? Because that's definitely an issue. I do work as a registered dietitian. So, I mean, when we're talking about food insecurity, as the rates of obesity continuously rise, we definitely don't want to neglect that issue as well. Because, you know, nowadays kids younger and younger are having type 2 diabetes, they're having heart issues. So we, I just want to kind of see where the individual programs stand as far as that issue goes. Yeah, so for us, we decided, since we did the process evaluation, we did not include any specific health metrics in our evaluation, so that's actually something that we want to do with the next iteration. But Wholesome Wave does have that as a component of the freshman and professional program. Well, ours are integrated into a health setting, so it's not just this program so these are school-based clinics where we're providing the, the, the physical health, the mental health, the dental health um, to these kids all year round. Um, we have dietitians on staff. We do boot camps in the summer. So it's integrated into their whole health care routine, and it's always being addressed. And so we do, um, we do see success. We do see challenges. Um, it's how you engage parents. Kids don't control what comes so you have to engage the parents. It comes down to income. It comes down to time. It's a, it's a whole host of issues. But we do see children really driving their parents to make changes. And you do see kids that over from 8th grade to 12th grade have gotten their health measures back in line and, and have achieved success. And you see, you see failures as well. But I don't think these programs are ever going to in isolation. They have to be incorporated into the greater picture of health. I'd say we we use just like how much we're producing and how much of that is in our community. For I run a small business, I grow produce and we try to engage people about um, the importance and value of that and the space and work that I do and the challenges of growing produce. I think we go to the grocery store and that. 
touch base on, on kind of what they're saying. It's, it's a long-term issue, and um, it's, it's something that, um, as a farmer, my goal would be, like, how many people can I get my produce into their house? Kind of going back to an earlier statement, the urban harvest, and then your farm as well, do you, I don't know how this works, but do you guys ever get like um, government grants to expand your farms into the homes of your communities or expand your, your gardens or anything like that? I mean, I know that government grants go out to help, um, you know, cure, quote unquote, these food desert issues. I think they mainly go through programs like Houston Food Bank or putting more fresh fruits and vegetables in the grocery stores near the food deserts, but has it ever been a possibility to explore expanding your farms? I think, you know, Sandra, you showed us the map of, you know, I can look and see your gardens are very close to some of like our resident clinic that's now located in, I remind me of the street. MLK and Grace. MLK and Grace, and there's a community garden right there. And, you know, a lot of our patients live in areas near these gardens or in the second ward. How, what's the best way to kind of connect our patients if they were interested in volunteering or getting involved? What would be the best way to refer them to you guys? So, I mean, on that, I mean, clearly they can run as a code, like the Palm Center, which is what you're talking about. They have a farm center there, and it's wonderful, and they have, um, sometimes we have work days in there, you know. So, I mean, if they're familiar with it, there's someone who runs it, and they can certainly go through us. For individuals, we tend to connect them with the garden just to leverage resources in terms of manpower. So, if they were interested, they want to run that. Um, kind of in the wake of everything that's happening in our community from the floods, are there any, um, from more of a systems level, opportunities you feel um, 
whether it's local policies or state policies that you've heard in conversations with different other community groups or with our local government that you think might come to the forefront and you know be an opportunity for change because that's really what our organization tries to focus on is more of those bigger opportunities for change um, that maybe have gotten passed over in the past that we or that have come to light because of Harvey? That's a big question. <laughs> Just curious. Uh, I, would, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I would argue for more farms. <laughs> <laughs> it serves more than the function of reproduction is, is our, like what we're trying to talk about. Um, you know, farmland, most of our county used to be farmland. And that's where it got into food production. It's, it's plays a part in the natural ecosystem of our topography and um, our geography. And beyond that, it's, it's part of our economy as well. Um, what happens to our rural economies when agriculture is taken from them? I like to say our rural economies are not um, trailer homes fast food chains. That's actually the, what's happened when you destroy the rural economy. Um, so I would argue the investment in more green space and productive spaces that, that serve our communities and our population in their ways. I would agree, specifically with like the water retention as well. Um, what I'm hoping that will occur is specifically the fact that we have to be better in the ways that we utilize our land and how we build on that land as well. So what I'm hoping to see the different colleges in regards to why build con concrete uh, freeways in that area that you know is there specifically for water retention and then are surprised that all the houses are being flooded. So, so that's what I'm hoping. But I think it is also a way to look at, uh, I, I think one of the things that's come out is just how fragile so many of our families are. One event really takes them over the edge. So, you know, looking at, you know, SNAP benefits in Texas, we're not the best, um, you know, in all those benefit standards and, and really understanding as we have pulled back so many resources at the state level, how one event then takes so many people over the edge. I mean, you know, Reggie and I have been working on a program and it's like, when can we actually launch? Because when are they going to come out of emergency? You know, kind of, kind of frame of mind. And, and so that program might not launch till January. Um, and that's just how fragile it is. And so I think it really causes us to rewrite a lot of the policies around stability of families and, and, and what we need to do there. I agree. And also just going back to I'm not sure if this is relevant to Houston, but just through you know basic things that I see um, online, there's a lot going on around vertical farming and urban farming. And do you know of any places in Houston that are are doing those things? Um, yeah, I'd say uh, there's there's a couple organizations that are on the board. There's a nonprofit that has a number of urban farms um, in the six ten. I believe are the best majority of them. They employ refugees um, to grow organic, fresh um, local food that they sell to farmers markets, farm stands from other locations, and to restaurants. Uh, I think for me, it's interesting that I am here as an expert in agriculture, being a 31 year old, because I know in most parts of the country that would not be the case. So I think my point to that is it's really kind of uh, underdeveloped and lagged, like Houston very lagged um, in, in, in this aspect. And we're trying to, to promote and have more things like this because it's, it's something that more people are interested in. It's, it's that, there's so many people who 
people that come out to my farm that just want to be healthy. That's that's their main goal, and it's extremely hard, unfortunately, in the city, which is why we have the largest food bank in, in the country. Um, and they do so much good work for our city, but um, we really want to find other solutions, and I think farming and urban farming can be um, a part of the long-term solution. So I, I really wish I could list more organizations that are doing that. And yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, well, one thing, we never know when we're the largest group organization. Another organization that helps us also do incredible farming is Indo Harvest, which is a national organization that is one of our partners in developing the farm for farm. Do you have any other questions? This will be for Reginald and for, I'm sorry, sir, I mean, <laughs> um, do you find that there's an issue with people willing to purchase healthy food when there are so many opportunities to access food for free? Um, does that create any kind of conflict where people sort of develop the expectation that they should be able to get these items at a pantry as opposed to purchase them at a farm or a farmer's market? Has that come up? Yes, I definitely think there's a, a certain group of individuals that will rely on the pantry system for whatever, for whatever reason. They may not, they might not be a vulnerable population, but I, I definitely think that's a small portion. Uh, just because I think, you know, just from my job as a part, I mean, most people want to be able to go to their grocery store, shop, and because they, they feel more empowered to do so. And, you know, you know what? And Carol just was earlier. All pantries are not created equal, so. Some of them are not going to want to go to the pantry based upon just the way that they're set up, how it works, and so forth. So, so I definitely think there's more of those individuals who are really using emergency food systems just for emergency food usage. And when they no longer have to use it, they are wanting to go back. Uh, one of the things that we've also considered with a lot of our programming is how do we make it to where it's easy for people to transition from, say, a food prescription program. Uh, that we're offering into something, into actually going to the healthy corner stores or to some of the farmers markets and so on. And so that's something that we're trying to try to put, more, put our hands together with along with our partners to identify with our goals, avenues for us to come from one place to get into a point to where they are more economic, economic and viable and are able to place money within their community, which also benefits the community. Uh, my perspective would be we're trying to get to the So thank you so much for such a great um, panel discussion and all of y'all's questions. <laughs>
want to thank our speakers tonight for coming. Um, and I want to give a quick shout out to the Kids Meals uh, group who's here, and they have a great display. Um, Kids Meals is an organization that provides meals for children zero to four years of age, zero to five years of age. Um, and they have some great handouts, so I encourage you to visit um, with them before you head out. Um, they're doing a great job addressing food insecurity and those kids that aren't in school yet, so they can't get school breakfast or school lunch. Um, so that's a, an area of need for that population. Um, and I want to um, have all of you guys uh, grab an advocacy action plan that you have on your table. We love having events like this, but we really want you guys to take what you learned tonight and actually do something about it, not just, I heard a great talk and that's it. So um, if you can take a moment to fill out your advocacy action plan, we have some opportunities on here of how you might be able to get involved, whether that's sharing the information you learned tonight on social media or participating with Doctors for Change and some of the events that we have coming up. We have a Doc Day event at the Houston Public Library this weekend on Saturday, so if anyone's interested in coming to volunteer with us, we would love to have you. Um, and we have a couple other events coming up um, as well as 5K walks that you can do with us, or if you're interested in your clinic or your organization collaborating with a food bank for some of the things that they're doing, that would be wonderful. So think about how you might like to be involved and fill that out for us tonight. Yes, Dr. Lovett. I just want to make a comment that out of a forum that happened here about two and a half years ago, um, hearing about what the food bank is doing, um, our prenatal clinic has um, formed an alliance with the food bank and um, our pregnant women living with HIV who come to group prenatal care um, now, well, before the flood, um, um, would go home from their clinic visit with 30 pounds of produce. And it just has been, it's been a lovely collaboration. So, and that came, that started right here. Yeah, and we're, we're very proud of the fact that we were able to connect them and that an event like this started a great program that's, um, helping out a patient population that really needs it. So thank you everybody for coming tonight um, and have a great evening.